What I'd like to do now is say a few words of introduction about our final keynote speaker of the day. We're moving again from a smaller country to a big country uh, with Ambassador uh, Aldona Sofia Wus. Ambassador Wus served as the United States Ambassador to Estonia from 2004 until 2006, where she focused on the development of the next generation of Estonian leaders, Russian integration, HIV AIDS prevention in Estonia, and the preservation of Estonian culture. Drawing from her medical background, Ambassador Wuss serves on numerous boards of philanthropic and community organizations and is a member of the American College of Physicians, the American Women's Medical Association, the American College of Chest Physicians, the Medical Society of the State of New York, the North Carolina Medical Society, and the Greater Greensboro Society of Medicine. Her lecture topic today, Using Culture Diplomacy to Share Our Vision Abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ambassador Aldona Sofia Wuss. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and I know you've had a very difficult day, so I will get right to the point. I think I'm the only thing standing between dinner. Is that? I will be brief and to the point. I, and I will be speaking today from my own personal view, since I am retired already from, from, uh, from the diplomatic corps and also from medicine, so I will be representing my own personal views. Small disclaimer. Uh, well, as we all know, cultural diplomacy has been in practice for many, many centuries. And the role of cultural diplomacy has really never been more important than it is currently. Not only is it a fundamental tool that is used in the United States to improve the United States image abroad, but ultimately it really impacts on our peace and our national security. Cultural diplomacy, when it is used either as a method of outreach or as a method of communication, it can be extremely effective. And its effectiveness is re really measured in the long term. Now, whether these goals of cultural diplomacy are to increase mutual understanding and respect among cultures, or whether it's used to advocate for US policies, to decrease anti-Americanism, or to simply create an environment for foreign governors, uh, governments and for foreigners to be receptive to the American message. Achieving these goals usually leads to an improved relationship between people and their governments and a greater understanding for us, both of our friends and our enemies. Now, a strategic integrated approach to cultural diplomacy can actually overcome our ideological differences in the world. This in turn can help decrease the conflicts around us and therefore improve our national security. We in the United States, we must continue to lead but also to inspire. Cultural diplomacy has been very effective in breaking down barriers, in building human relationships, in developing trust and understanding, usually through the arts and through education. But now, more than ever, it is very important to include in cultural diplomacy medicine, commerce, and actually religion as a tool of cultural diplomacy. Now, why? Well, in my view, it's pretty simple. What do most people in the world really want? Most of us in the world want to be able to provide for ourselves, to provide for our family, hopefully to be healthy, and in the process of all this to take place in most of the world under the watchful eyes of God. So what better way to influence foreign governments and the people than to share that bigger vision through targeted cultural diplomacy. This visible diplomacy of deeds, when it is combined with real information of fact and lots of publicity, can help mitigate misconceptions about the United States and allow the people in the world to be more receptive to our views. 
we can actually help them develop a proper perspective of America. Now, I'm sure that most of you here understand the importance in the bigger picture of cultural diplomacy. But what do we in the United States have to do to ensure that the increase and the utilization of, of cultural diplomacy, how do we get to incorporate this into our national and foreign policy strategies? Well, I would like to advocate that all of this should really start here in this room. It should start with you. By bringing an understanding of the greater importance of cultural diplomacy, actually with a touch of ingenuity and a touch of creativity to all of our work. Each of us can help create the necessary foundation to promote the view of the importance of cultural diplomacy as a strategic tool. We must advocate actually in our industry for rewarding competence and expertise as well as creativity in this field in our government. We need to create a career path, a career path of cultural diplomacy that leads to leadership positions in policy and national security. We should advocate for continuing education with graduate's degrees in areas that are useful in the field of cultural diplomacy and also reward periods of personal and professional experience and education that is done outside of the government in order to broaden our views and our experiences. Cultural diplomacy, to, to be most effective, it really needs to be integrated with an interagency strategic approach. Now, I, I will offer you some very, 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 very small examples of creative cultural diplomacy. Things that unfolded in front of me while I was able to serve as the United States Ambassador to the Republic of Estonia. We created in the embassy an embassy-wide outreach program. Now, with this program, we would travel through the entire country as a team. And everyone in the embassy was asked by me personally to volunteer to be a part of this team. In these teams, we would take everyone from our traditional foreign service officers to our local hired employees, to our military personnel, to the embassy nurse, to my driver, to myself. We would create teams that would essentially, from the embassy, make trips around the entire country. We would, of course, meet with the local government officials, but also with the local press. And subsequently, we would find either businesses or cultural institutions to visit. And in the process of this, we would end up at the end of our trips at a high school on every single trip. By the end of my time serving in Estonia, I had, we as an embassy had visited over a hundred schools. Of that, I think most of them I personally attended. I didn't realize Estonia had so many high schools. During, during these trips to the schools, these were very important. We spoke to the larger school body during that time. This brought an awful lot of good press to the country and an awful lot of goodwill. Of course, this was a huge impact on the next generation of Estonians. We actually hired, gave a small grant to the Estonian Film School to follow us around the country and create a DVD about our activities. And we distributed this DVD subsequently to every single high school in the country. On one of these trips, I noticed that there was a wonderful new school, and this school had a beautiful new soccer field next to it, but the soccer field was empty. And then I was when I inquired why it was not being used, I was informed that the soccer field actually belonged to the school that was in the next building. It turned out that one school was an Estonian school and beautiful new soccer field, and the next school was a Russian school. Well, it turned out that not only did the two high schools not play against each other in soccer, they actually didn't really speak to each other. 
Well, looking at this from an American's point of view, I saw it as instantaneously as an integration problem that I needed to solve quickly. So what we did is we contacted both of these schools and we asked them simply, would they like to participate in a soccer match? The Estonian school against the U.S. Embassy. Well, they jumped on that opportunity. Well, we asked also, the Russian school, would you like to? And they jumped on the opportunity. What ended up happening is I asked, yes, we'll do that, but on one condition. The Americans and the United States Marines will play on one team, and the Estonian school and the Russian school will play against you, but you have to combine a team together. Well, to make a long story short, the end result was we did have a soccer match. The United States Embassy with our Marines and everyone in tow, and the Russian and Estonian school as one team as our opposition. The outcome was absolutely fantastic. Not only did we have tons and tons of local and national press, we also had the local mayor attend, and to our surprise, we had a visit from the Minister of Population to be there. Well, everything went absolutely perfectly except for one thing. The United States Embassy lost the match. <laughs> well, there were many other numerous, very wonderful and obvious benefits from this interaction. First and foremost is most of these students have never, ever seen an American. They're, another benefit, their principals and their coaches of these schools were actually forced to work with each other in order to accomplish this mutual goal, since they both were determined to defeat us. We received great press, and because the minister showed up, and probably for some other, re you know, it's obvious reasons, the minister added importance to this sporting event. And this was crucial for us, because this was the time when we desperately needed support from the local Estonians, because we were seeking support for the Iraq war when it was not popular in the country. Ultimately, just so that you know, the Estonian government subsequently did send Estonian troops to Iraq. Now, if for me it is obvious, then when you show respect and interest to others, they often reciprocate. And they reciprocate sometimes simply by making it easier for you to work together. And this, in turn, makes it easier for us to advocate for our interest and to share our vision. Another example of opportunities of cultural diplomacy that unfolded was that on one of our trips and excursions out of the embassy, we were visiting an old religious home, a church, of an, a very old religion which was mentioned by one of our previous speakers of old believers. They're a very, very old religion persecuted by the Russians and subsequently fled and some of, uh, uh, some of the folks ended up in Estonia. So I was visiting this old uh, religious institution of the old believers with one of our local, with one of their local mayors. And this ancient clergy member from this religion was proudly showing me this old home. Their church of hundreds of years had burnt down and they relocated to this old building. I was, act I was truly fascinated by this man and by his religion because I really knew nothing about it. He must have sensed that I was genuinely interested in what he was saying. And he called me over at one point, whispered in my ear and said, come with me. So I walked further on with him. We came to these stairs and he opened for with his big key, he took out and opened the old door and he, he he opens his door under the stairs, and I go, <gasps> and in this area, old, moldy, dark, what he brings out to me were his books. They were 17th, 18th century, century handwritten music manuscripts that were underneath this, this stair, an old, moldy place. Well, the, just to say, these manuscripts are priceless. Uh, they're actually quite known here in Washington to our national archives and through many other archives in the world. Well, this, uh, this old believer community is tiny, and they have no money 
to, to send these any place to be, to be refurbished or saved. At the same time, the Estonian National Archives had no money in order to take these from the old believers to preserve them. So that's the long and, store, the long and short of this. Looking at this when I left, I, I said, how can you not do something about what's right in front of you? So I decided to see what I could do to help with the situation of pre preserving history for our international community. And I spent months trying to find money to save these precious documents, both from the United States and from Estonia. I was not going to give up. I tried to secure funds from the State Department, from the United States business community, from United States private donations, even from our national archives. I also tried to secure funds from the Estonian side, advocating at every opportunity with the Estonians about the Estonian nat national culture. I was not going to give up, but it had, for me, it really would have been irresponsible if I did not act. Months went by of this work of trying to find some way to pay for this, this, uh, these, these manuscripts to be preserved. And I was at some official function, and I was sitting next to the prime minister. And at one point, the prime minister leaned over to me and whispered in my ear and said, Madam Ambassador, you have it. I said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you. What is it that I have? <laughs> and he said, you have it. You have the money. And I was looking at him, trying to figure out where he's going with this. and wasn't quite clear what the topic was. And it turned out that the prime minister had earmarked for the na from the national budget money to preserve these documents after months of my <laughs> begging, <laughs> of my begging. Uh, well, so why exactly did the prime minister act on this versus another cause? Was it perhaps that the Estonian Prime Minister was watching from afar for months as the United States Ambassador was advocating all over the world to try to preserve his, his history? Or was it for a different reason? We will never know. The end result, they ended up going to the Estonian archives where they preserved them and developed a relationship with, with uh, the old believers and somehow they they're okay. Well, not more than a few months after that, long and behold, <laughs> uh, the Prime Minister and I were able to cooperate on a business summit in London, where the Prime, Prime Minister and I were actually recruiting businesses to invest from Europe into Estonia and into the United States. And so the Prime Minister and I, after that, worked very well together. Why? Again, perhaps because we had mutual trust and mutual respect. Now, my third and fourth example of targeted cultural diplomacy is very simple, but yet very effective. For all the receptions at the residence, and we would have in the evenings constant receptions, regardless of the purpose of the reception and regardless who the VIP that was invited that we were honoring at the reception, I chose to always invite two top Estonian students from some place in the country, two high school top students, with one of their teachers to attend. At these functions, we actually introduced the two high school students and their teachers as the VIP. Now, why was this so important? This was truly winning the hearts and minds of the nation. Many of these students had never even been in the capital. They've never seen their own representatives ever, yet alone the United States representative. So the Estonian leadership was quite impressed and, and uh, quite surprised with coming into the room and seeing their own high school students at these events. Another example for one of these receptions, I had invited representatives from the entire country of the religious groups. At the end, it, we had 17 different religions represented at a reception at the embassy. These folks traveled for miles to come to this event. Most of them have never been invited to the United States Ambassador's residence. 
And they were extremely thankful. They were thankful for the opportunity actually to be with each other. The relationship that these religious folks develop among themselves was only a benefit to the United States because how wonderful it is to see religious tolerance blossoming. Actually, this small event was interreligious dialogue at its best. My last example of cultural diplomacy is really the use of the medical field. Now, whether it was in a small way for myself in visiting the hospitals, visiting all the AIDS clinics that were run by the NGOs, whether it was meeting the doctors, we hosted a huge reception for the medical community at the, at the residence, or was it being the keynote speaker in the country's main medical conference speaking about AIDS and HIV at the time when this was not a popular subject in the country? or the bigger picture of the medical community, the bigger picture and the use in the United States of our naval hospital ships to provide humanitarian aid, or President Bush's major incentive to combat, combat AIDS and HIV in Africa. This brought tremendous goodwill towards the United States. Medicine and the medical field is one of the strongest and most effective tools in diplomacy that we have. Now, my five small examples of targeted cultural diplomacy may seem trivial in these difficult times in the world when we have bigger issues to face, but these really are examples for you of an effective way of looking at cultural diplomacy. If you utilize <laughs> opportunities that are right there in front of you to do the right thing, if you develop trust, and respect with foreign peoples and governments, this in turn will make it much easier for you to, to promote, in my case, our national interest. If we use cultural diplomacy in an integrated, strategic manner, we actually can influence the world as we share our bigger and broader vision of the United States abroad. Now with that, I'd like to thank you and get you off to dinner, and uh, I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. <laughs> then dinner it is. Hi, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks. And you're absolutely right how to approach cultural diplomacy at the grassroots level, like you mentioned, just inviting high school students. But uh, my question and my challenge as a public diplomacy practitioner is how do we conduct cultural diplomacy to undemocratic nations like in Iran, like in Afghanistan, like in Pakistan, where we have huge cultural differences and how we look at culture? I appreciate your remarks. I, well, uh, obviously that, that is a far greater challenge than in a, a wonderful, stable democracy as Estonia. Uh, it, it, it promotes many challenges, but I think the basic concept of showing respect to people that we come across uh, is something that crosses all boundaries in the world. So that, that I think, is, is fundamental. And also offering opportunities when we can, whether that is in the diplomacy of deeds, such as <laughs> medical, uh, which in, in, in the countries you're speaking of, we are able at, in, in, in some way to offer that. Those are really tools of cultural diplomacy, whether it is in education with the exchange students. And we still can do that from countries, even with our enemies. An example of how effective um, exchange students can be, uh, for the purpose of, uh, of those of you who may not remember, Estonia was a democratic country, then its democracy was taken away after World War II when it was incorporated forcefully and lost its independence uh, uh, and incorporated it into the Soviet Union. It was attacked by Germany, then by Russia, and then subsequently incorporated into the Soviet Union. After the uh, democracy was reinstated and Estonia regained its rightful re-independence, all of a sudden you had to train an entire country in democracy. 
And we were very fortunate to be able to take to the United States through whether uh, government organizations such as Fulbright student, with exchange students, through private organizations, many, many people to the United States to train them, educate them, and send, the, send them back. And there was a period in time in Estonia where most of the leaders were 27, 28, uh, the, from the prime minister to the cabinet to all the ministries were in that zone of in that 30-year, 27-year-old age group. And it was interesting because most of them at some point had been in the United States on exchange programs, even though they were living under communism. So, so there are opportunities to, to educate and uh, to, to offer, I, I don't want to call it assistance, but medical diplomacy and, and other aspects, even in tyrannical environments. Much harder task, though. Yes. on the reaction to cultural diplomacy is of Estonia after the Russian attack, the partnering with Google? Uh, in, in the cyber, secur yes. cyber security tax? Yes. In reference to cultural diplomacy yes. between the, the way the way a government partnered with a private entity to host a, a website and the government website, et cetera. And, and what was the, you know, the cultural diplomacy thinking at that time? I'm not sure I understand the question, so I may be answering the wrong question. But there was an issue. There was an issue. Just uh, Estonia is in is a paperless government. Uh, they everything is electronic. They even to the point where they even vote on on their cell phones. Well, not maybe not their cell phones, but on their computers for their for for their leaders, which is just absolutely fascinating. It's totally paperless. Uh, everything is live. All the ministries, all the meetings. Everything, everything from your, you have on your cell phone, I sometimes laugh, from your blood type to your uh, parking, everything is on your, on your cell phone. So there was a point in time, uh, very recently, well, someone had hacked into the Estonian uh, uh, networks. And uh, that shut down, it was a crisis, that shut down everything. It was equivalent of shutting down our Wall Street, shutting down our hospitals, shutting down uh, uh, our banking, our educational system, everything. The entire government was shut down because it's, an, it's a e-government. Everything was shut down because of someone hacking into the system. It turned into a national crisis on top of, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of loss uh, uh, un un unfolding. It was tracked down subsequently that that uh, hacking came in from an IP address that was subsequently uh, uh, believed to be from the Kremlin at, at one point. And the end product of all of that was that right now, in present time, there is the Estonian National um, uh, Cybersecurity NATO uh, College right now in, in, uh, in Tallinn. I think it's called the Estonian uh, a cybersecurity excellence institution, something like that. Uh, so they are so far ahead in technology than, the, than we are in the United States and that most of the world is. It's just absolutely fascinating. We in the United States can only learn from the Estonians in reference to that type of technology. And the hope of having a, an e-government, I don't know if that's in my lifetime, maybe it'll be in your lifetime here. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not sure if that was the question that you were asking. In reference to a question maybe a generation before that, how was it possible for a country that came from uh, b being incorporated inside of the Soviet Union, which had lost all its freedom, to emerge as within a short period of a decade uh, to uh, one of the global leaders in technology, uh, and uh, how, how could that have happened? Well, that was a conscious decision of the government to figure out with a small population, uh, with very little resources, how do we now advance as a, as a democracy and what do we do? And they made a conscious decision to go into, instead of physical labor, to go into the intellectual labor and therefore it went into the IT sector. And they made conscious decisions to educate the entire population to be computer literate. Literally putting, <laughs> putting in computers into uh, the farmhouses and, 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 and um, uh, fire departments so people would come in and learn. Well, Google hosted the government website, Estonia, so a private entity in the United yes. States, actually. So I was just wondering if you knew if that was okay with our government to have a private institution like Google host a foreign government as Estonia. I thought that was remarkable. Well, in, in, in Estonia, the, uh, the, it, it, Estonia is a very democratic country, so private government uh, interaction is very common there. It's, uh, it's not a competing force. 
it's a plus multiplier to an effect. It's, I think it's viewed a little bit differently. Um, Chris is my name once again. I was just trying to add credence to what you just said. Back home in Nigeria, we have what they call the PPP. It's called a private uh, um, public uh, partnership. So a private company can come in and establish a partnership with um, uh, the government, with a public government. It all boils down on the service they are providing. You know, the uh, U.S. government might not have such a um, 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 institution to come and start doing um, such work to a particular government. Uh, so for the U.S. government, what I know is that they try as much as possible to create enabling grants with the policies and other um, international bilateral agreements so that their business, um, 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 their investors within the U.S. system can as well go overseas and do something. So it's not um, a bad thing for a public, f a private firm working for uh, the government. Uh, Madam Ambassador, my name is Zeke. Uh, I just want to ensure you that you are not between me and my food or dinner because I'm here for the fact that I love food for thought and that's what you are giving so that's it's good and I'm enjoying it. Uh, in the United States there is such a thing as separation between church and religion and I was wondering how you would go about doing uh, or including religion as part of uh, cultural diplomacy, even though I know the importance of, of religion in shaping cultures, but it's kind of sensitive issue, I say. Uh, yes, but the separation of, of church and state does not apply to it, it being uh, excluding religion from our heritage. Uh, we in the United States are, are a, a, we were founded on the principles of religion. See people seeking religious freedom to come to the United States is one of the reasons that we actually appeared <laughs> at the end of the day. Yes, if you, if, if you, if you study how, how, how we came to the United States. And if you look at the statistics in the United States, we are a religious country. Pick your religion and practice it. As long as you're not infringing on my religion, you can practice whichever religion you want. So we're, we're basically, by tradition, a religious country. And it's part of our heritage, it's part of our upbringing, it's part of how we feel. And as long as we're respecting, um, believe in this or not believe in that or whatever it is, we're, we're okay as long as we include each other. So I don't think that th that is, um, we're not, not promoting one specific religion is when you, you're using religion as a cultural diplomacy. You're, you're learning about other people's traditions and religions and you're teaching people about the religions in the United States and how it impacts on our culture, our families, our life, and, 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 and how we really work here. Uh, I think it's a very powerful tool, uh, religion. When we don't uh, incorporate religion into our dialogue, when we intentionally exclude religion from our dialogue, uh, to some countries that may be odd because they're uh, much more religious than, than we are. Um, so I think there's a balance that's really easy to achieve uh, in, in diplomacy when it comes to religion. I think it's an easy thing to achieve. Yes, sir. Yes. There's, a, there's always a little bit of difficulty with the narrative about the United States. There's a man by the name of Laroni uh, Bennett who worked with Ebony Magazine. I'm sure you're familiar with it. He wrote a book before, it's called Before the Mayflower. Some of us didn't come over here on the Mayflower. Some of us came over here on slave ships. And, and so, it's rather disconcerting sometimes that this is not mentioned. That we t when we talk about the founding fathers, uh, we talk about people who actually owned slaves, who were slave masters. So in trying to figure out what American values are, what they were and what they are today, some things get left out. And you know, for me, I just have to be honest with you, it pains me. It pains me 
that that is somehow left out of the discussion, you know, uh, out of the historical fabric of the discussion. Uh, he asked a question about the separation of church and state. Well, there are some theories about our founding fathers. Some of them were perhaps indeed atheists. Uh, I believe it was Thomas Paine who, who wrote The Age of Reason, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we, you should read that book, perhaps. I mean, not, I'm not talking to you directly. I'm just talking about in general. And uh, this country was not based or founded on any particular religion. It gave people the right to practice their particular religion, but it did not impose in, in and of itself uh, the idea that a person had to have a religion or that we have a state religion. We do not even have a, a state language. There is no requirement in this country to speak English. In fact, I grew up in Detroit and I knew people who didn't speak a word of English. At least their grandparents didn't. They were first generation Americans. So there are many people in this country who uh, don't fall into the category of being English speaking or being Christian or being Muslim or being Jewish or being atheist or whatever. We have a, a wide range, a plethora of beliefs and positions in this country. I'm a Vietnam veteran. And what also what pains me is the fact that people don't talk about the dissent in this country, uh, the dissent in the Pentagon. Some people were for the, the Iraq war, others were against it. And I think that has to be stated, you know, that just because a country goes to war doesn't mean everybody's behind it. Uh, we have soldiers in the United States military now who criticize it openly, generals, colonels, uh, majors, former uh, uh, veterans, former uh, commanding officers, and you have people who support it, of course. That's obvious. So I think for a healthy discussion, we need to see all sides of the coin, or both sides of the coin. Well, it, what you said is exactly what I was speaking about. <laughs> That, that when it, your question was in reference to, to religion as a tool of cultural diplomacy, that's exactly it. The United States is the perfect example of religion and cultural diplomacy. We have a heck of a lot of different views in the United States pertaining to religion, and the fact that when, when, you're, when you're discussing that, especially when you're dealing with foreign peoples and foreign governments, it is very impressive that we in the United States can have so many different beliefs, and yet, we're all here, and and that's a, that's unique in different parts of the world. We don't have a a, a state religion. We don't in, impose a, a, a we don't have a, a actually national language. English is just recommended. It's not a, a, an official language for us. Uh, we. I, I actually was not born in the United States. I'm a foreign-born national. Um, I learned English when I came to school. And so there, th this is America. I mean, uh, what the gentleman was saying in, in the bigger picture is exactly it. And that's why different, different parts of the tools of, of cultural diplomacy are a part of a bigger picture. And you, depending on what your goal is of cultural diplomacy, you can pick an assortment of different tools from that box in order for that to be used. And so when you mentioned about religion, it actually is uh, something that for some countries is very unique, that we're so, we are basically very tolerant. Wherever you came from, if you're living in the United States, you can practice whatever religion you want, whether it was on the slave ships, whether it was uh, uh, Native Americans who were here in whatever country you came from. No, we're, but we're basically a religious country. And um, that's ju it's just a tool. It's one of the tools that we have, whether it's medical diplomacy, uh, religious diplomacy. Uh, it's part of cultural diplomacy. All right, well, Your Excellency, thank you very, very much for the lecture and also the discussion that, that came from it. I think there uh, it was uh, quite impressive to see also the amount of questions and, uh, and comments you inspired, despite being the final keynote address of the day. So that's a sign of success. So if we could please join all together in expressing our gratitude to Ambassador Wuss. Thank you.